Tony, I am so stoked you're here, man. How is your Sunday going so far, thus far? Um, well, I just did a crazy workout, so I'm pounding a protein bar. Oh, hell yeah. And some crystal light lemonade in this workout bottle. It's a good looking workout bottle. Your biceps Thanks, are looking bro. large, sir. I'm trying, dude. I'm trying. Um, Sunday's great. We took the dogs for the walk, up for a walk, our usual deal. We've got three rescue dogs. So my wife, Annie, and I, we took them for a walk. Slept in a little bit. I'm reading a new book um, right now called Lanny. I just By Max finished. Porter. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. We'll see how it goes. And, and then I just finished one this morning. I finished the like, last few pages of um, Joe Hill's Strange Weather, which is a collection of short stories. And that's Stephen King's son. You a big reader. Well, I've been trying, like, this is the perfect time to catch up, you know? Sure. Yeah, um, we had, that's kind of what I've been thinking too. We started like a book club a couple of weeks ago God, on the dude. show and we had our first author, Drew McGarry. I don't know if you're familiar with him, mm -mm. Um, but we did his book, The Post Mortal, because same thing, I'm, I'm trying to get myself back into the flow of reading during this obviously shitty situation, right? Right, I know. So uh, have you read his book yet, Post Mortal? Yes, it's, it's great. This one, his Post Mortal is actually, uh, was his first novel and it came out in 2011. He had another one come out literally like yesterday. Um, but uh, no, he's, he's phenomenal. I was gonna ask you a question. Do you always differentiate when you mention your dogs that they're rescue dogs? Always. Always. Yep. And is that I mean, for the sake of potentially always. striking up the conversation? Um, not really. There's so many dogs out there that need to be rescued. And like, you know, uh, my wife got her first dog, Lucy, who's maybe I'll grab her later, but um, she got her from a golden retriever rescue, I think in Northern California. So it's like, if you want a specific breed or a type of breed, like there's a way to rescue those kinds of breeds or sure. at least get something close to it. It's just at this point in the game, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those a weird things. world, right? It really is, man, because I'm here, you know, especially when we're shooting in, in South Carolina, there's so many purebred dogs. And it's just like, uh, I guess, you know, there are very specific circumstances. Like my, my in-laws have a purebred golden that sure. is, is older, but she has adopted. Um, she had been, I, I think she was like the runt of the litter or something like that. But nonetheless, she had been of a litter of purebreds and had been given up for adoption. But, you know, she's got like hip dysplasia and all kinds of health issues from being purebred. So my wife and I are big, you know, supporters of rescue dogs. And we do a lot of work with that back home. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. So. Dude, I was reading up on you, kind of like studying you, uh, really stalking you good. And I did not realize that you graduated from, uh, from VMI, from Virginia Military Institute, but, but more importantly, that you played four years of D1 lacrosse. <laughs> yeah, I did. Like, you don't strike me as a former lax bro, and I mean that with all due respect to both you and former lax bros, but did you fit that mold at one point? Uh, I don't know, dude. It's really funny because we were watching the, my wife and I have been binging that show Billions. Yeah. And in the show last night, I think we're on season three, but there's this one character and, and uh, Damian Lewis like walks into the office and they were making sports analogies. And, um, and the one guy goes, yeah, I'm a former laxer. And he goes, ah, laxer, cross. I always pinned you for a football guy. And uh, <laughs> it was just kind of funny. My wife like looked at me because, you know, lacrosse, I still play, dude. I just had some stuff sent out to me. Uh, and uh, I, I play on a, a little league in South Carolina when I'm there and a little pickup league in LA when I'm there. And for me, especially at VMI dude, where it's like all military all the time, like yeah. cross was an escape big time and uh, kind of normalized life. Thank God for me there. And uh, I had always had this dream of playing division one lacrosse and I was able to kind of live out that dream. Out You're also an Eagle Scout, which is funny. One of my best friends is an Eagle Scout. I only made it to Weebelow, man. I hope you don't judge me. 
Uh, you're a black belt in Taekwondo. I only made it to like the fourth color. I think it was like tangerine or some shit, but you're truly yeah. like a, you really, I mean, this is one of the things that, that, that I want to bring to light. You're a Swiss army knife of a human being. You truly are one of the more <laughs> unique and, and like well-rounded people uh, that I've come across. Uh, yeah, well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you're, you're a Swiss army knife of a man as well. I, I guess- try, I try. I guess it was, you know, a lot of it when I was young, you know, I think both of my parents, and I think you probably can, you know, relate with this. It's like your parents hope that you do some of the stuff that they wish they had done, you know? Yeah, so like, for sure. You know, I feel like my folks had, my dad had played like one year of JV football and like, you know, um, I, I just, I feel like it was a, a combination of things. My dad only made it to life, didn't make Eagle Scout, you know, and then, my dad had always wished he to join the military. So I think a lot of these things were like, give it a shot. This was something I had wanted to do. You give it a try. And same so you did all my, of them. I legit did them all. And, you know, it started off with dance. I danced. My mom enrolled me in like tap and ballet and jazz when I was like five. And I loved that. Did that for three years. And then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came out. And oh, then yeah. Like, game over i gotta get into taekwondo and so dude that was what it was for me that's the exact same thing i was a huge teenage man i had dude i had no lie probably a thousand of the little action figures on the day my little brother was born the gift my grandma gave me was a, a shredder action figure like yes. i still remember this shit. i was obsessed with teenage mutant ninja turtles exact same thing that got me into taekwondo right i remember my best friend went and saw tmnt2 Secret of the U's before yeah. I got to go see it. And I remember like getting a knock at the door and he's like, dude, there is a super shredder. <laughs> and just like, like, you know, like, what? A shredder on steroids? <laughs> dude, that's what it is. Here. That's dude. essentially what it is. Yeah. So like, you know, and then scouts, um, I don't know, man, like it, scouts, like, so I had so many friends, like as soon as we got in high school, dropped out of scouts. Right. And I was like, screw this. I'm going to be the cool kid that still does Boy Scouts. <laughs> like, I don't know, man. It was so um, influential for me because my dad, like he worked as, you know, he, he worked construction. So that was kind of like the time he was like, at, you know, he was a kid, you know, right, when, right, when right. you're out doing scouting stuff, hiking or winter camping or whitewater rafting or ski trips. He like organized these really cool, fun trips. It wasn't just tying knots in one camping trip a year. I mean, we did really cool shit. And um, like rock climbing, spelunking, he, he organized these amazing trips. And then my junior year in high school or sophomore year in high school, we did this epic high adventure trip to uh, Philmont, New Mexico, which is like this big scout reserve that they might lose because of this whole bankruptcy thing. But we oh, had like 110 miles in like seven days. Good God, man. It was awesome, man. I mean, it was like the real deal. We, we, uh, we hiked up to like almost 13,000 feet on this one peak. It was really cool. Holy shit. Uh, oh, for those, like a lot of people obviously uh, discovered you on HBO's The Righteous Gemstones, and they might not realize that sort of what I would, at least categorize as your big break, if you would. It actually came on uh, on School of Rock, which came on the air in 2016. And it's the same premise as the Jack Black film that everybody knows and loves, except yeah. you are the Jack Black character, the teacher, Mr. Finn. What what did landing that in sort of, what has that experience been like? Because that's, you're the leading role. Yeah, dude, that, I mean, that was, there was so much emotion and, you know, hard work and everything wrapped up into that. It was really, a dream come true and granted like i mean I'll, so i got that part almost eight years to the day after moving to la so that was like my first series regular role did it feel like one of those coming together moments in life where it's just like Dude, i'll never forget it man I, I mean i had had so many not failures but you know auditions not go my way at that point. I mean, at that point, probably a hundred pilot auditions that had not gone my way. And I was fully prepared for this one not to go my way. And, you know, my wife and I, um, we were engaged at that point. I didn't have a regular job. I was teaching at the Groundlings. I think, 
I had stopped being a janitor at that point. So I was doing some personal training and teaching at the Groundlings. And I remember we got the phone call. We were in the kitchen of our house and we both were like just crying sitting at the dinner table. Like our whole lives are going to change, man. It was really, it was, uh, you know, it's everything you're, you, you put all that hard work into, you know? So the first day you show up then yeah. for the role, what, tell me about that feeling. Cause it's like, you have all that emotion. You have this, this watershed moment in your career where, I mean, where you're, it's like out of a movie, right? You're at the table with your wife crying. Like it's, that's a, that's a scene out of a movie. So and yeah. So what was that like the day you showed up to then have to fucking do it? I, I don't want to muddy the waters at all, but there was some drama. So what happened was is Nickelodeon and Paramount were working together to create this show. Okay. And at the time of its conception, they were doing like a nationwide search for this character because I had read the pilot script and it was literally a continuation of the movie. I mean, uh, basically it was going to be a Nick at night show for adults and kids Okay. in its first inception. So I got cast. And then what happened was, is Nick at night got the ax, no mm-hmm. longer existed. So the property all of a sudden became um, just a Nickelodeon show. And now something with our business is like, once you have a show somewhere, if you don't have a studio executive or something behind that show, it can get really difficult for that right. show. And for me, and I think everybody to hear this, it's like, it's School of Rock. It's a like guaranteed huge property. And I mean, yeah. And I remember when we were doing all the negotiations and everything, it was like national tour, like merchandising, like the whole big shebang. And then I think it got handed off to Nickelodeon. And there was this huge Viacom shakeup going on at that point. And what had happened was, is like, I think they were just like stressed out about having another thing on their plate that wasn't right. anyone's baby at this point. And so um, it was like, I booked this thing in like October of 2014, bro. Oh shit. Yeah. And we didn't even cast the kids. I don't think until a, like almost a year later before we even shot it. So it was such a waiting game of like, is this going to happen? When's it going to happen? Oh, that's and hell. I'm, dude. It, so it was like all this buildup and the dream coming true yeah. and everything. And then it was like, wait, is this not going to happen? Are they really not going to make the school of rock TV show? And then finally, like, I remember that first day, like driving to set at Paramount studios, which is just a dream, dude. It's like this old Hollywood studio and they shot. I love Lucy there. I mean, they've shot like everything so much history dude i I did a tour of the grounds or whatever and it's like uh yeah it's true it's like being at the masters or something like augusta for me it was like magical bananas yeah Yeah, it's bananas and so that whole first season was absolutely incredible the kids were so wonderful and my wife and i had you know um working with kids people can say oh it's crazy well this is a funny thing that i think people actually get a kick out of so um Nickelodeon's not like immune to that. They know that it can be really difficult, you know, it can be work, di- yeah, difficult working with anybody. It's but, different. You yeah, know, it's a different experience. Yeah. And I think the idea of like stage mom or dads can be a little crazy. Well, during the casting process, which I was very involved in, um, they had like a mole in the lobby <laughs> looking for crazy parents. Oh my God. Yeah, if there was like any drama in the lobby, it would get like reported back. Dude, you got to spy on those parents though, man. Parents are fucking crazy. You never know. Dude, and we lucked out. We got the best kids in the world. So talented. And like my wife and I were like from day one, we were like, we want to make this a family environment. This is different than any other Nickelodeon show because I'm actually part of the cast. It's not just the kids. Um, And we were just like heart set on this. And the other cool thing we did is we did a lot of, um, every year we did like one or two sessions with the Groundlings where we would all get together and improvise and learn the rules of improv and, you know, how to add to a scene and and give and take and that kind of stuff, which was really cool because, you know, that's a skill that, that, you know, is invaluable in the workplace. And 
I also just made sure that the kids knew that like, hey, this took me eight years to get. This might be our last job. So let's cherish every single day. We get to come to work and make TV money. And you tell that you know, to the children? Yeah. <laughs> Like not, it's, no, well, it's a great it's lesson. Not, it's just, it's funny. not about the, it's not about the money. You know what I mean? And I, and I'm no, di- for sure. I mean, they need to know that too. Like, but this the opportunity a, side of it. Yes. The opportunity side. And also just like, let's not get caught up in how many Instagram followers we have. Or, uh, yeah. You know, the fame of the stuff, like let's show up for work and just have fun. Let's not get stressed out by what's going on behind the scenes. Like let's be a, a group of, of actors who get to just show up and have fun. How, how many people get to do that? Less than 1% of actors work, you know what I mean? So like the fact that we get to show up and do make-believe for a living, like how incredible is that, you know? And so it was really a special experience, but this is something funny. So we're shooting the third episode. Okay. And um, we would do rehearsals Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we would shoot Monday, Tuesday. Maybe I'm getting that wrong. Maybe we'd shoot Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, rehearse Thursday, Friday. Okay. So we had rehearsed Thursday and Friday for the third episode. I showed up Monday and all the sets had been painted new colors, like bright new colors. Okay. And so this was when the whole shift happened to, oh, this is no longer a show for kids and adults. Obviously it was but it became much more kid centric. They got the note big time to make it much more kid centric. Then from there on out, it was a lot of pies to the face and you know, uh, gotcha. how, many, how many brownies can Tony eat? You know, <laughs> hey man, and, and dude, that character was like an amplified version of myself and I loved it and connected to every minute to it and you know, poured my heart and soul into every bit of that. And it was, it was a blast. You mentioned uh, the Groundlings, and, yeah. and it's funny because I only learned about the Groundlings a couple years ago. I didn't even know that that was a thing, it's, but it's where people like Will Ferrell and Lisa Kudrow and Kristen Wiig and Phil Hartman and John Lovitz and Melissa Car- McCarthy and Craig T. Nelson, like so many random incredible people cut their teeth. Um, can you kind of explain how it works though? Yeah, dude. So, I, when I, so when I moved to LA, I didn't even know what the Groundlings was, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but I graduated from BMI worked that summer uh, after graduation and then packed up my car, my Nissan Altima and drove across the country and showed up. And that first summer I was there, I was doing extra work, I think on a show with Damian Lewis called Life and I hated it, but I made a friend and, and, and they were like, um, you're funny, you should go audition for the Groundlings. And I was like, what is that? I don't know, but I remember going to the homepage that night and there's like Will Ferrell and Sherry O'Terry. Right. And I was like, what is this thing? And I signed up to do the audition and I showed up. And from that audition, I was like, oh, this is what I meant to do. Like I knew exactly like that style of comedy, that full commitment, just like the Eagle Scout thing, the black belt thing. I was like, I can dive into this 110% and like playful, joyous, silly, character driven. I was just like, I'm in. So from there you do, you know, the first two lovers are, are all improv. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's a nice microcosm of the industry because everything there is pass or fail. And then after the third level, it's like, you can't retake anything. Oh shit. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's pretty cutthroat. So um, in the sense that like, so is the industry and it's very subjective. So it's kind of nice in that way. Um, but the first two levels are improv. Then in the second level, you start learning how to write for yourself and characters that you create with a specific point of view. And then the third level is all writing based and you end with a show and you either get passed on to the next level, which is again, all writing based and you do two big shows and the groundlings vote on you. And then the next level, you get invited into the junior company, which is called the Sunday company there. And then that's where I met my wife in 2011. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. We were both in the company together. And I also tested for Saturday Night Live that year from the junior company as well. And then from there, after you do uh, a certain number of six month periods in there, you're eligible to uh, get voted into the main company. And I've been in the main company there now for, oh God, almost eight years, seven and a half years, something like that. So 
you mentioned, and we mentioned, I mentioned all these, uh, these legendary names that, that kind of either started in the groundlings and then went to SNL. Yeah. Um, first thing, like who, who did you watch the most growing up? Cause you obviously have some like, like Chris Farley in you in terms of physical comedy and in terms of your energy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that's a guy that I that I looked at as a kid as the funniest man alive, right? Like he was a god to me. Um, so I and I have like so much like I'm not I'm not an actor, obviously. I'm not even a stand up comedian, but I still have like those are the people that I respect the most and that I uh, that I idolize the most. So I'm curious, having you know, with your background, having gotten through or it's still being doing Groundlings and all the improv stuff with that as such a heavy part of your influence, who were the people you watched as a kid growing up? I mean, I was a fat kid. So like Farley, 110%. I mean, like, so my brother was a senior when I was a freshman in high school and I was like 210 pounds. And my brother would like introduce me to the hot senior girls and be like, this is my brother, Tony. He weighs 210 pounds, but he can do a killer Chris Farley impression. And so like, I just do like fucking Farley, you know, fat guy in a little coat or, you know, where he's got the muffin. It's actually a, a role, I believe. Yeah, oh my God. And, uh, but I mean, from like day one, that guy, I mean. Yeah, dude. And I Total comedy. It. Oh, I love man. it. Squeeze it. And I love it. you. Oh God, I love you. I love you. Oh man. So, so Farley good. for sure. Farley for sure. Uh, I mean, I just, I grew up watching so much comedy. It's like, I mean, our, our standards were, I remember we had them on Betamax. We had Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Okay. We had Three Amigos. Yep. Animal House. Um, I mean, once they came out, Tommy Boy and Dumb and Dumber were like standards. So uh, those were I, mine. Like I was, I'm like a few years behind you. So I was, those were my wheelhouse. It was Tommy Boy, Ace Ventura, Liar, Liar. Oh. Dumb and Dumber, all the classic Farley, Adam Sandler, Jim Carrey movies. Yeah, dude. And I mean, Car- Jim Carrey too. I just, I remember watching him on In Living Color, which was so revolutionary already. And just, dude, yeah. you know, I mean, the characters they were doing on there. And like, I was just telling, telling my wife the other day about that amazing, like roided out female bodybuilder character he used to do. <laughs> that was so great. And then uh, Fire Marshal Bill. Yes, dude. Oh, my God, dude. And he would do, like, Vanilla Ice. And uh, it was, I I mean, just never seen anything like that before. Um, I I mean, those guys, both of them were were huge influences on me, you know, growing up. But Farley in particular, I mean, I remember when I found out he passed away when I was, like, in eighth grade, like, sobbing. I mean, I was just like, that guy was my hero. I didn't even have the capacity to really even be upset at that because I yeah. was like, I was a little bit younger and I was just like, yeah, what? You were a heartless little child. Yeah, I didn't know like life had any negativity yet. I was like, no, 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 no. He's fine. He's yeah. fine. Just like, when's his on next movie coming out? Yeah, exactly. I just, I just watched Almost Heroes like 47 times instead because <laughs> that was like the last thing he did. Um, Question. Will you ever make a run at SNL again? Or is that something you have interest in? Or what does that look, what is, where is that in your career now? Because you've obviously, it's almost like you, do you, do you even need to go that route now? Like it wasn't just one run. Uh, so in 2011, I had just gotten into the Groundling Sunday Company and I had done this show. I'll never forget it. I did this show and um, I had a sketch in where me and this amazing uh, girl, Kate Frisbee, we played these two like motivational speakers. We were we would get an audience member up on stage, and we had uh, we had lost a ton of weight, so we, it was like about like changing your lives and okay. and this whole thing and and uh, you know whether it was losing weight or getting a new job or whatever. And we would get an audience member up, and I got this like hipster dude, and I was like, oh man, look at this guy's beard. God, he's got great facial hair. I wish I could grow facial hair. And totally forgot I was wearing a fake mustache. And, <laughs> And he so dryly went, you got a mustache, man. (laughs) And it crushed me. And I could not stop laughing the whole rest of the sketch. I totally ruined the sketch. I just was having a ball. And the next day I went to like go put costumes back or something at the Groundlings and the managing director called me in her office. And she was like, hey, Tony, um, do you know who was here last night? 
I was like, no, no. And she was like, well, they're, uh, the casting director from Saturday Night Live was here and they asked specifically for your information. Oh, so then shit. I had like a full on panic attack. Oh, like, dude, no. It, and uh, and the, the, the whole note was that they loved how much joy I was having on stage. Okay. And so that ended up like working in my favor. And so they wanted a tape. And so this was in like, I want to say this was in like May. And so I put a tape together, sent it out in July and it sucked. And they were like, yeah, if this is what you got, we're not interested. So then I put another tape together and um, maybe I'll post that on my Instagram or something. What do you have to put together? Is it like, do you, what do you do when Characters you say Characters and stuff. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, they usually want, examples of yeah what like five minutes usually. And it's gotcha. like, again, like they want some impressions, they want some characters, but bottom line, they want it to be funny. And that was the thing is like the second tape I put together, took some stuff from the groundlings, took some other stuff I shot. And I was just like, let's just knock funny, 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 funny. And so I sent that out. And then I got a call like two weeks later that they were going to fly me to New York and, te- and have me do a live test on the stage. So I flew out there. And this is in 2011. 2011 and I just started dating my wife at this point like we were like two months in brand new arm relationship she flew out there with me and like right oh, this makes walking. you look great this makes <laughs> you look so good so right at like right as I'm I'm walking out the door to go audition I I'm like uh okay I'm gonna go I love you and I leave and that was like the first time I ever ever said I love you and dude like, it just <laughs> slipped out yeah it just slipped out and so like then I had like a panic attack in the hallway <laughs> And I like went back in and I was like, hey babe, uh, I meant that, but like, I know it's kind of soon. So like, I, I I'm just gonna, gonna go. <laughs> so I went and dude, it was super surreal. I stayed in Bill Hader's dressing room. Like, what? I thought, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought it went great. Um, but uh, as we all know, I went on to do like 10 years on SNL. It was amazing. Yeah. No, but, <laughs> No, but you know, I, I didn't get the job, but I got great feedback. They said, we really like him. We'd love to figure out a way to get him on the show. And I always thought that was them blowing smoke up my ass. But uh, it was really funny because recently I went to go see a taping I was shooting in New York this last fall. And uh, we went to a taping and that same casting director was like, man, we wanted you on the show. Oh. We just didn't quite know where you would fit in, which kind of ties into my, like my whole career is like, the easier you can make it for people to visualize where you fit in, the better you have it, man. And at, you know, at that point, like I had been brand new into the Groundlings. That was my first real audition. Right. And then I, I put, together, put together a tape the next year. I did Montreal the next year. Didn't get another shot. I did one more in 2014. Didn't get another shot. And then School of Rock came. And was, was there like, a resistance ah. to that? Because I always find, because you're so exactly right, you have to, and it's something you learn over the course of your career, obviously, how to better market yourself and position yourself for a, yeah. for a job. And that applies to any field. Was there a resistance for you as an artist and as, as such a unique um, person? Was there a resistance to sort of put yourself in a box like that? Because I, I have certainly felt that before where I've, in my career, I've been detrimental to myself because I've sort of refused to do exactly what you're speaking to and instead make leave things a little more confusing. Cause like, nah, man, I don't want to have to make myself presentable or some other version. You know what I mean? I, yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I was like, I'm the Farley. I'm the, I'm here. Nobody can do this physical stuff. I'm here. Like right, the right. whole end of my audition was like three minutes of a upper level grad student in a movement final at Juilliard. Okay. And, he, and he's cramping up the entire time. <laughs> and I was just like, that's what I am. But at the time, I mean, I'm me. And I had short hair and it's like, well, that guy looks more like Joey from Friends. Like he could be the straight guy, but I don't know if anybody wants to see a beefy guy who's not Farley in size or, you know, falling around the stage. Right. Isn't that you know? a weird concept though, dude? Because you mentioned you were, you said you were a fat kid and that made you identify even more yeah. with Farley. I was a skinny kid and Farley made me wish I was fat because he was so much funnier. If you, it, and that's such a weird thing in comedy, how your weight plays into it and your general appearance and shit. Because now obviously you don't have short hair anymore, man. You have crazy no, ass hair. It's fucking phenomenal. Well, and I mean, that was the game changer for me, bro. So I, I came back from testing 
for SNL and I didn't get the job. And then I went through two like horrific pilot seasons where I was getting like that. He's green. We don't get where he fits. I was going out for everything and nothing felt like it was sticking. And then three years later, I finally decided I was like, I'm going to grow my hair out and see what happens with that. And then that was 2014. And I tested for stu two studio pilots and then School of Rock came along. And it was like, all of a sudden people were like, oh, that's who he is. What the fuck? The lettuce. You just needed the lettuce. You had to Bro, grow it out. I mean, it was the weirdest thing. And I mean, it's just, I think I just made it easier for them to see who it was. That's why like anytime I do like an audition tape now, it's like the easier I can be, I can dress, change my look to make it look like that character. You fit different stuff. Yeah. The better, you know, right. like, like, you know, auditioning for Ozzy, putting that tape together. It's like, I did the eyeliner, I wore the dress. I had the hair crazy. It was, you know, same thing with gemstones. I went full mullet, you know, weirdo, black shirt, you know, satanic cross, just like the whole thing. I mean, I'm just like, all right, let's, let's do this. I've done all this character training. Let's, you know, make it as easy as possible. Let's talk about Keith. Uh, it, it's time. I grew up going to a mega church in Houston, Texas, and it's, it's not the one most of you listening are thinking of, fortunately, but Righteous Gemstones was obviously so, 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 so funny to me as a result. First question is, did you have any experience in the church before you played this role of Keith on this show? Um, as far as mega churches, not so much. I or did go to church. Yeah, I went to Catholic school, um, kindergarten through fifth grade, and I did not like it. I've always, I've always had like, I feel like a good contact with like a higher power or whatever. Sure, but sure. I, like um, the church thing, just like it always kind of felt funky to me. And like, I mean, just to get real specific, so yeah. our next door neighbor. Um, passed away from AIDS when I was in like sixth grade, I believe. And oh, I remember, real as hell. yeah, it was real. And um, that was like my first experience with any of that. And you know, I'm, I'm from Virginia. So that was like, what's happening? Like yeah. I had only known what AIDS was from the real world, you know, right. from right. Pablo on the real world. And I remember when my mom, who was at that time, long story short, she has a longtime partner but at that time she was with another partner and okay. um, Aunt Jan. And, sure. uh, and <laughs> at that time, like I didn't know like the whole impact of everything, but nonetheless, we ended up going to the funeral service for this man who was so sweet and kind to us. And like he had had a family prior um, he was a okay. homosexual man, but I guess he yeah, had a closeted. family prior, yeah, before he came out, and they didn't come to the funeral. And mm. I mean, just heartbreaking stuff. And pretty much, pretty soon after that, we we left the Catholic Church and we identified then as Episcopal. And uh, because of the obvious, the feelings the church had about homosexuality. Yeah, I think that there was a lot of that, and then there was just, I mean, like I remember, like there would be like, okay, the student union's organizing a march downtown, an anti-abortion march, who's going? Right, so you know? they were aligning with shit where you were like, uh, that's the exact same thing. Kind that's, of with me. As, you know, as a kid, I'm like, is that what we're supposed to be sixth graders marching on the mall? Um, you, you know what's funny though, man, is it, I, I obviously totally understand where you're coming from and I, I understand the perspective as well and how that, that certainly pushes a lot of people away from like, I think organized religion as a whole. Um, but it, the impact for me was weird when I started to notice that type of shit as a kid in church, like all the weird ways that it wasn't accepting of certain people. It was less of me being like, all right, fuck this. Like, I don't know about all this God stuff and more of like, yo, I'm pretty sure just this system is broken here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think these churches are set up the way they're supposed to be, which is why the righteous gemstones is like seriously dude it, i i never realized i had waited my whole life for somebody to do a comedy built around that around that concept of sort of capitalistic religion right around this yeah, this mega church uh thing and i think people who watch the show and have never been to a mega church don't realize just how accurate it is it's it's a parody for sure but oh my god it's an accurate parody it's an incredibly accurate parody um so it just it brought me so much joy to see that to see it unfold on the screen and then dude the the 
the fact of the matter is that Keefe was the undoubted sh- like show stealer f- on, on this series so far. Oh, thanks, man. Um, and I had no fucking clue who you were going into this series. And it to like, dude, the second your character was introduced, I was like, who the fuck <laughs> is that guy? And then by the end of the season, obviously, I, I was in love with you, and I've been following you on everything ever since. And and we obviously, I was fortunate enough to get connected with you so that we could eventually have you on the yeah, show. And it's it, just yeah. been a dream, man. But um, Keith, how, like, was he more or less outlined for you in terms of like what you were going to go for, or did you get to build this character, this beautiful reformed Satanist? I mean, the writing was on the page about. I mean, all his lines. And all those scenes were already so genius. And I just, again, just like School of Rock, I mean, the synchronicity and the luck and and the talent and everything just lining up. I mean, it was a total miracle because School of Rock had been canceled. My wife and I were talking about this. School of Rock had been canceled in the fall of 2017, I Mm -hmm. believe. And then that pilot season, I was like, great, pilot season again. I'll jump right back in. I had just shot the Ozzy Osbourne thing. I was like, that'll break me out of the kids' world. Right. And then pilot season came and went. I tested for one thing, didn't get it. And I was like, oh my God, now I have this Ozzy Osbourne mullet. I'm totally fucked. <laughs> and uh, From Netflix and, is the dirt, by the way, if you haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, uh, my wife was with, my wife Annie was writing with her writing partner who had just come from an audition where she was dressed in her Sunday Beth. Beth. Uh, best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> her name was Beth. No, uh, <laughs> dressed, dressed in her Sunday best. And um, my wife was like, why are you all dressed up? And she said, oh, I just auditioned to play Danny's wife in this new show that he wrote. It's about a mega church. And Annie was like, can I read the script? She read it. She was like, Tony, you have to read it. And I read it and it became like our sole goal to get to go in and audition for that show. And we kept pushing and kept pushing. And finally, I got the chance to go in for the Satanist. And uh, <laughs> Originally, it had been written just like Farley, big, uh, a big uh, fat guy. Yeah. And uh, he had been kind of based off of this actual Satanist turned minister. And so, like, when I got the sides, I was like, uh, this really isn't me at all. So let's swing for the fences. I mean, it was obvious there was some kind of a weird connection between him and Kelvin. And I was sure. just like dude, I want to take that to the next level. And I just want to, you know, just like I had done with Ozzy, like, let's just swing for the fences. And so I remember it, my wife and I had been up in Tahoe when we got, when I got the audition. And so the whole drive back, we were kind of workshopping this character and kind of who he was and how, I mean, this guy had just gotten out of a Satanist cult. So it was like, we want to make sure he's like a big baby who's just right. completely uncomfortable. And I had done, I had done, I had done this like little series back when I was doing YouTube in like 2013 or 2012 called the insecurity guards with my buddy, Josh McDermott, who he plays Dr. Eugene on the walking dead. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So he, he was our officiant. He's like one of my best buds. He was. Our, our oh, no shit. I had no idea y'all were buddies. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. So we did this series where we played these really weird insecure security guards in a parking lot. Okay. And it was kind of, that character that I took and transformed and kind of morphed into, uh, into Keith. And that's kind of was the, the resulting, you, you guys see what, what he became. How do you go from Mr. Finn to, to Keith Chambers? That's called range, I think, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the groundlings, dude. I mean, it's all about point of view and creating these three-dimensional characters. And I yeah. mean, it... it, it, it it has been such a, I mean, look at Melissa McCarthy, man. She got nominated for an Oscar for Bridesmaids and now she's done everything under the sun. I mean, talk about range. And it's like, you know, I, I think that's, you know, it, it, it's been really cool with Keith because he's so dramatic at the same time. He's right. such a, like a weird, and dark, deep. yeah, deep, like, you know, guy that it, it, it's, it's been really cool to, to get some cool opportunities based off of this guy that are, allowing me to stretch even more and create even, you know, way different characters than I ever thought I would ever create just coming out of school of rock, you know? Dude, last, uh, last year I saw you on Instagram, um, celebrating 10 years of sobriety, I believe. Yeah. And a, a couple times a year on this show, at least we do what's called a quitting day. And it's, and it's because I, I'm, I'm, I quit drinking in October of uh, 2017. 
Nice. First of all, congratulations on a, on a decade that's fucking insane. Thanks. Um, but we do what's called quitting day. And coincidentally, it's today's episode. Monday's episode is going to be it's quitting day 7.0, where we're getting people the opportunity, giving people the opportunity to quit. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, what was it like playing Ozzy Osbourne on the dirt as a sober person? Like, how, what was that experience? How Because it's so conflicting, right? Yeah. I mean, again, the great thing about this is like at the Groundlings, I'm playing an average of six to eight characters every weekend you know so like i had done drunk guys a million times okay so you know for me it was really studying what ozzy was like you know um back in the 80s and kind of how'd you go about doing that um i just researched a bunch of videos of him back in like 82 through 86 and what he was like and i mean the fact is is that guy was you know i mean yeah yeah, he wasn't shit-faced all the time but you know, all those mannerisms were kind of there, all even already at that point. Yeah. They were already kind of under the surface. Yeah, he was a little more energized. And they didn't want the guy from the TV show, you know, but he sure. was, you know, he was for sure, like, already feeling it by that point. And, sure. um, you know, I think that was, he was pretty functioning at that, you know, at, at that stage in the game. And, you know, being on Coke, which was one of my big issues. And... And, Me too. You know, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and being, you know, drunk, I, I remember what that was like. You, you were, you know, most of the time you weren't like slurring and out of your mind when you were coked up and drunk, you were yacked out. And the fact that I could drink a, a whole case of beer was like the, the plus side and not be completely shit faced. Yeah. And that so, combination is just fucking awful for alcoholics. Oh, oh, just the worst. I can't imagine, you know, meth. Oh um, God. But needless to say, like, that that stuff doesn't phase me as much anymore. And and I'm I, you know, I trusted our director that if I was going, you know, swaying, you know, too sober or too wasted, you know, he'd help me zoom it right in. But it was uh, you know, that hasn't really been an issue for me. I mean, it's very rare now, almost, you know, at like, you know, ten and a half years sober that anything will kind of phase me, you know, even going out to the bar or right, you right. know, friends or being at parties with friends it's you know you, you learn how to cope with that completely you know it, to kind it, of to give you a frame of like reference um a lot of our listeners are 18 to 25 either in college or just exited that sort of yeah. point in your life where like so much of your focus is on drinking and getting shit based and partying obviously and it's like so i get a lot of questions from people about you know how do you figure out you know how did you realize alcohol wasn't for you and stuff like that and it's like it's a thing i try to relay two listeners and people with that question that it's like it's different for everybody your sort of path away from alcohol is different for every single person i've ever met whether in aa or outside of it people who don't go the AA route and so i wanted to ask if you would uh, if you would share any of your path away from alcohol for us why you why you quit what that was like you know etc yeah i mean for me you can only decide whether or not you have a problem and that's what you'll read you know I always, for me, I only drank to get drunk. There was no time where I just wanted to have a couple beers. I didn't like the taste of beer. I don't right, like right. the taste of beer. Nobody likes the taste of vodka. <laughs> like, I mean, I would just switch it up and be like, now I'm going to be, you know, fancy. And I, I just, I like old scotch. Yeah. And I would get an old scotch and drink all of it in one night. And it's just like, no, you know, and for me, I, I was really lucky, dude. So, you know, Eagle Scout, Black Belt, you know, great parents growing up, you know, went to VMI. And then all of a sudden I'm like a janitor who has in a Los record, Angeles. a janitor in Los Angeles who has a record who's almost getting fired every day being a janitor. And it's like, what was the common denominator? And for me, it was very clear. I was very lucky in that my bottom was very clear. And as soon as I removed alcohol and drugs from the equation, I started to, um, you know, experience some success and some clarity in my life. And I continue to evolve in my sobriety, man, and and really work a strong 12-step program that continues to really um, guide me in in, in my life. And, and, uh, you know, I got everything I dream I ever dreamed of, man, but from, from getting sober and and, and clean, you know, I got married, I got jobs and, uh, you know, 
I get to wake up in the morning and just feel sleepy. And <laughs> dude, isn't that the best? Over. I mean, fuck, man, great. I'm tired. Is the best feeling in the world compared yeah. to like it feels like my head might explode at yeah. any given moment. I've now. just smoked two packs of Parliaments. I'm watching the sunrise, <laughs> and I'm all out. And I I wonder when my drug dealer is going to wake up. Yeah, that's a much different life, dude. And honestly, that's what I tell people a lot is like, if you don't know, if you're like really unsure, like, oh, I don't know if I have a problem, maybe I just am binge drinking and then quit for a week and see how you feel. If, yeah. I think for a lot of people, if you remove it, it's like, oh, God damn, I feel like life is way better this way. Like, maybe it's just not for you. That's the way it is for some people. And I also say it's like, you know, it, yeah, we already covered it. It's your everybody and everybody has their own individual path, and you sort of have to figure it out as you go. There's no one, you know, one thing you can point to to say if you do this, you have a drinking problem. It's like yeah. if you're asking yourself at all, you're already taking the right steps. Yeah, and for me, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like alcohol. Alcoholism is a disease. It's been medically described as a disease. Yes. There should not be a stigma any longer whether or not, hey, he can't hold his alcohol or, hey, it's weak to be an alcoholic or, right. hey, you're so weak because you can't stop your cocaine or your heroin. It's, it's like- It's an American thing though. That's an America deal. Well, dude, it, it's in an international thing, man. And the thing is, is that the fact is, is, you know, if you're willing to face those things and get completely honest with yourself, man, that- takes courage that takes bravery that takes strength you know and so for me i think you know if you're already deciding to kind of question those things and face those things right then yeah man i mean more power to you keep doing that i know there are some tests online like whether or not i have a drinking problem and you know i think it's pretty clear i think there's even one on like the aa website like if you're really having some issues go check it out it's an anonymous program no one has to know, you know, hey, I'm, uh, I've decided to stop drinking because I'm going to run a marathon. Well, whether or not th anybody has to know when that marathon ever is and when you might start drinking again, that's, you know, that's Fucking exactly, you know, up to them. So, I mean, you know, I, I always say, you know, give it a try. But, you know, if uh, you, you'll, you'll discover um, yourself whether or not uh, there's an issue. Tony, uh, during this time of like a great, there's so much just negativity and like uncertainty and, and a lot of boredom as well. And you seem to maintain such a positive attitude all the time. How do you recommend people kind of like keep their shit together during this um, whole situation? Well, again, like I'm super lucky, dude. I've got, uh, I've got my AA fellowship <laughs> and my 12 step program that I'm pretty much connected in daily. Um, and this is kind of like what I always say is just try and be a service, you know, yeah. if you're, if you're at home with your partner and you know, they like a certain dish, like make it for them and then do the dishes afterwards and don't expect anything in return. You know, uh, don't just sit be a around. nice person. Yeah, man. Don't sit around waiting for your loved ones to call you call, pick up the phone, call them, you know, find a good book, uh, you know, donate to direct relief for frontline foods or the cdc and hit that donate button on instagram have some other people donate i see a bunch of people dancing on instagram you know like there's dude, your uh, dance videos fucking crack me up man thanks dude on you know, instagram but, them shits are, that's my energy <laughs> dude that's the energy i need in my life yeah well you know it, it, it's again that that farley deep down inside that chip and dale's dance is always <laughs> In the back of my mind, man, he was the best. Dude, for a big guy like that, nobody could move like that man could. For oh, real. man. I mean, I read and like every time he would do like a, a late show or something, he would do some bit where like he would eat it coming out of the curtains where he would get all wrapped up in them. And I mean, the guy just, he was, a, he was wonderful, wonderful light. Physical man. comedy, man. I'm telling you, it made me wish I was fat. And then Jim Carrey is the one that gave me the, like, I was like, all right, no, you can be funny and be skinny too. This is huge for me. This is huge for me. Yeah, dude. Uh, hey, I, just before I forget, I read that you and your wife, that y'all at one point, y'all got certified and immunized so that you could actually put in work at, at the children's, one of the children's hospitals in Los Angeles. Um, could, could you speak to how y'all got involved there a little bit? And then also like, obviously, I don't know if you can still go do that or if you're, Right now you're working or what, but like, is there, 
is there anything you're doing or that you recommend outside of the stuff you just mentioned that people do to help out here? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, um, so I had been LA, in LA for whatever, like nine years or something like that. And the Groundlings had this thing where they were like, hey, come do improv at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles. And this was like five years ago now. And I okay. went and I did an improv show with some Groundlings members there. And I was like, I love this. I need more of this in my life. And so I reached out to our wonderful friend, Samantha Lamb, who ran the, the program in the department at that point and asked if I could volunteer. And I think she was kind of like, oh, who is this, you know, actor guy? It's, you know, he's not real. And man, it was like three months of like taking tests, background checks, no you shit. Know, piss tests. Yeah. Immunizations, forms back and forth. And, and, uh, you know, I, I went the distance and then shortly there afterwards, my wife did. And then we've been full-time volunteers there every Thursday, whenever I'm, you know, not working or in town right. for like almost the last, almost five years now. And what all do so. you, what all do you get to experience there? And I mean, I've been told from so many different people who, who do volunteer work in, in children's hospitals specifically, yeah. um, exactly how rewarding and the kind of energy that, that is both needed and that you take away from an experience like that. So usually Thursdays, it's just getting to chill with the kids. They just want to be kids. Yeah. That's, I mean, like the biggest thing, the, their folk, their parents, their brothers, their aunts, their uncles, whoever's there with them want a little break. And the kids just want to be kids. So a lot of times, you know, we go there and we work in the arts department, which always can use more fundraising. So um, I'll post a link somewhere in my stories when we release this for them. Right on. Um, and we also do big fundraising events for them every year, too. We just did a big one for Valentine's Day. They do a, a March one. Um, March Makes, I think, was the last one they did. But you know, we go and we usually do arts projects with them every Thursday. We, you know, we did Valentine's Day cards with a really cool, renowned artist. Cheryl Burke came in from Dancing with the Stars and brought in oh, this shit. diamond art, you know. And so really, it's just sitting though and letting the kids talk and, you know, listening and responding and, and asking about their favorite TV shows, their favorite musicians, what books they're reading. And um, it's, it's a really, really special experience for both of us. And we're, we're so grateful and lucky that we get to do that um, and, uh, and honored that they have us every week. And, and we've been doing that for, for a few years now. So, Tony, I, I can't thank you enough for giving us a, an hour of your time, man. You're the best. Uh, I wanted to ask you before we let you go, first of all, what can, what can we look forward to seeing from you next? I know you and your wife have a podcast going or yeah, yeah. So if you guys go on Instagram or the website, it's slopthepodcast.com for our website. And it's at slopthepodcast on Instagram. And it's, uh, I directed it, my wife wrote it and stars in it. It's uh, kind of a, a, um, a parody of, of Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow's like wellness yes. podcast. So it's kind of all these woo woo characters that we've kind of created at the Groundlings. And my wife plays kind of a Gwyneth type character, Skipper Parvo, who has these. <laughs> doctor pseudo doctors entrepreneurs come on the show and interviews them and they talk about very silly topics and it's really great so check that out if you I love will. this concept yeah yeah and then um uh i also i just finished a feature right before uh right before i came out for gemstones called we broke up that hopefully will be out sometime soon this year and then uh hopefully fingers crossed we get to go back and do some uh, some gemstones sometime soon so we can bring you all season two. Dude, can't wait to see uh, can't wait to see season two of gemstones. Can't wait to see we broke up. Can't wait to see everything else. Uh, can't wait to listen to your, your wife and yours podcast as well. Tony, thank you again, sir. Um, have a phenomenal rest of your Sunday. I'm going to hit you up off air and we'll talk about it. you and I, we discussed potentially doing some type of Instagram. Lo I was challenging you to a dance off. Yeah. But okay. And we were going to do it in the stu in, on, on, on the zoom call that we're on right now. But I've got headphones and I don't even like I couldn't figure out how to get my speakers to work. Long story short, we're thinking about doing one on Instagram live. I'll holler at you out there and I'll bring the people any details they need through social media. Yeah, let's back do, and it. do the same. I'm stoked to do that. That sounds like a good way to get us all through a fucking Monday a little bit happier. Right. I love it, dude. Tony, thank you so much again, dude. Have a great rest of your Sunday, brother. All right. Thanks, Ross. And thanks for everyone for listening.
Go low, baby.